Welcome back everyone, it's me Matt. We got a weird one for you today. What are we looking at? Well, this is a very peculiar concept tank of the US military, the M1 Abrams AGS. And it's basically America's ultimate tank defender that never really was. Imagine a M1 Abrams, already one of the most powerful tanks in the world, particularly at its time, being re-engineered to just not take on enemy tanks, but also swat helicopters out of the sky and tear drones to shreds with guided missiles and heavy auto cannons. Well, that was the exact vision behind the Air Ground Defense System, or AGDS, a prototype concept published in the Armour magazine back in 1996 that proposed turning America's iconic tank into the ultimate battlefield guardian. It was designed to protect armored columns from air to missile threats, something that the US sorely lacked at the time. Now, bear in mind that this is a concept, you're now going to look at absolutely ridiculous footage from Grand Theft Auto of it being utilized in a video game. And I know many of you get very upset when I don't find footage of things that relevant to the particular thing I'm talking about. Well, wake up folks, I can't generate things out of nowhere and I don't have an editing team or 3D editing team to create visuals that are beautiful for you to watch of this concept vehicle. So this is the best you're getting. If you don't like it, well, suck it up, buttercup. Now, it's a little wild how much of the AGDS feels like it's predicted the future. Laser guided missiles, dual role anti-air and anti-tank capability, advanced optics and radar, and a fully networked battlefield strategy. This is basically America's version of the Tunguska. By the mid-1990s, the battlefield was changing fast, and not necessarily in favour of big lumbering tank formations. Attack helicopters like the Soviet Mi-24 Hind and the Ka-50 Black Shark were getting faster, smarter and deadlier, with air-to-ground missiles capable of destroying a tank from outside visual range. At the same time, precision-guided munitions were evolving, drones were actually starting to begin to make their entrance into the battlefield, and older anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns simply just couldn't keep up. The US and the M1 Abrams, the tank on tank superiority fighter at the time, sure was the best selected to protect against danger from the skies. But the short answer is, well, this isn't really the best selected option. Back then, the Army's short range air defense mostly consisted of systems like Stinger missiles mounted on Humvees, the Avenger, and some legacy platforms like the M163 Vulcan. These were either lightly armoured or immobile, and worse, they couldn't keep up with the pace of the survivability of the Abrams-led armoured thrusts. Soviet forces, on the other hand, had already integrated SPAAGs like the ZSU-23-4 Shilka and later the beautiful 2K-22 Tunguska. Vehicles that combined radar, rapid-fire guns and missiles and could accompany tank units quite quickly and directly. And the US knew this was a problem. In training simulations, just one or two well-coordinated helicopter teams could, in theory, wreck an entire armoured battalion. This vulnerability was not theoretical, it was documented. Asymmetrical and peer threats alike were adopting more air mobile doctrine, making it obvious. The US needed a frontline armoured mobile air defence vehicle. Not something that hung back in the background or the shadows and also not something that required a separate convoy, a proper guardian. And that's where the AGDS concept comes in, a battlefield solution that could move with the spearhead, take a few good hits and even fight back. So what exactly was the AGDS? As I said, it stood for Air Ground Defense System and the idea was simple, but extremely ambitious. So they took the M1 Abrams chassis and replaced its main gun and turret with an entirely new system designed for both air and ground threats. The concept came from engineers at Western Design Howden, Dr. Asher Sharoni and Lawrence Bacon, who saw the growing vulnerability of armoured forces and proposed a way to fix it. Their plan was published in the July-August 1996 issue of Armour magazine as I had presented before, and at its core, of course, using the hull and the armour the same as the Abrams, meant it could survive some frontline combat and wouldn't need specialist logistic support. But instead of that beautiful 120mm smoothbore main gun, the turret would now house 12 ADATS missiles in retractable pods and a pair of Bushmaster 3 35mm automatic cannons, along with a state-of-the-art sensor and radar suite. The whole platform would be able to keep up with the Abrams formations, operate autonomously or in network groups, and engage both flying and ground-based threats at long range, mid-range, or even close quarters. Now, unlike early attempts like the rather beautiful looking but also kind of ugly and completely pointless M247 Sergeant York, which I have done a video on in the past, go check that out, an air defense tank based on the outdated tech and flawed radar, 
The AGDS concept was designed from the ground up to integrate smart weapons, passive optics and powerful weapons. The vehicle was supposed to have a crew of three, commander, gunner and driver. The turret was designed so one crew member could operate both systems, four weapons in emergencies and modular armour, blowout panels, dual feed ammo, stabilised sensors. This thing was years ahead of its time in its conceptual configuration and while it never left the drawing board, the AGTS laid down a foundation of discussions that echoes even in modern battlefield doctrine. And it wasn't just tough though, those 35mm guns were very very useful in its configuration. It did have the laser guided dual purpose missile systems as well, developed by Erklon Boyle in Switzerland and tested both by the US and Canada. Each ATDS would carry 12 of these beautiful missiles, 6 on each side, and what makes it unique is it wasn't just an anti air missile, it could take out tanks too, basically turning it into a basically tank destroyer in some regards, which I know many of you get highly triggered when I say tank destroyer. The missile packed a dual purpose warhead capable of penetrating over 900mm of rolled homogenous armour, meaning it could destroy just about any MBT of its era and had an effective range of around 10km. With a top speed of over Mach 3, it could engage jets, helicopters or even distant armoured vehicles before they got close. Most importantly, it used laser beam riding for guidance and no radar lock. That meant lower chances of detection and much less susceptibility to jamming or decoy countermeasures. Of course, backing up those missiles were two 35mm Bushmaster 3 automatic cannons with 250 rounds per minute on each gun and they were fed by a dual feed system that allowed the crew to switch instantaneously between airburst HE, Sabo, armor piercing ammunition. The Bushmaster 3 was no joke. With advanced proximity fuse shells like A-Head, developed by Urkelon, it could create a cone of deadly projectiles right in front of incoming helicopters, drones, rockets even, and this made it ideal for a last ditch defense where missiles weren't fast enough and could be of course a lot more expensive to use. For ground threats like light vehicles or infantry in cover, the cannon could lay down fast accurate fire making the AGDS a serious threat even without its missiles. But weapons are only as good as the sensors guiding them. The AGDS was packed with tech that put it decades ahead of its peers. The system was designed to work under the most intense battlefield pressure where jamming, stealth and surprise attacks were expected. The primary fire control setup for ADAT's missile systems combined thermal imaging flare, a TV tracker and a laser rangefinder. Instead of just relying on the radar entirely, which could be jammed or targeted, it used passive optical tracking meaning it could lock onto targets without even revealing its position. A coded laser beam rider guided the missile right onto the mark and gave it the ability to engage those targets very quickly and up to 10 in sequence while remaining functionally completely invisible to enemy sensors. The secondary fire control system handled those twin cannons and included a J-band pulse Doppler radar tracking system giving accurate positional data even in low visibility or ECM heavy environments. The system could calculate lead, distance and trajectory in real time meaning the fast movers like drones or attack helicopters couldn't really rely on the agility of alone to survive. But the genius didn't just stop there, the AGDS was also envisioned as part of a networked defense grid. Six vehicles could operate together as a battery, sharing sensor data and handing off targets between one another, and one vehicle's radar could track while another engaged. That level of cooperative engagement in my opinion is now only just becoming the standard with systems like NASAMS and even modern IBCS. Backup optics and manual override systems gave the crew multiple ways of keep fighting if by some chance their indirect artillery hit their position and the radar was out and jammed, or just completely busted. The crew could rely on visual cues. But why didn't it happen? With all that capability, you're probably wondering, why wasn't it built? Well, the answer boils down to timing, as always, funding, and actually perception. By the time the AGDS concept hit Armour Magazine in 1996, the Cold War was over. The Soviet Union had collapsed and the US military was downsizing. Budgets were shrinking and procurement programs were getting cut left and right. The ADAT's missile system and program in general, which had been adopted by in limited fashion in Canada, was dropped by the US. And of course, due to shifting priorities, there was a painful failure from the Sergeant York that really left a sour taste in the entire US military's mouth. Funding for SHORAD or short range air defense was seen as redundant in the world where America assumed it had total air superiority. Instead the army doubled down on long range missile systems and air launch solutions which to be honest with you made complete sense and I would agree with. 
mobile air defense was deprioritized and the AGDS a private sector proposal without a formal army contract or program of record never got traction. It sat on paper and then it disappeared. But here's the kicker. The problems with the AGDS were meant to solve a problem that actually still to this day hasn't gone away. If anything, they've got a little bit worse. Fast forward to 2010s, the US military found itself scrambling to fill a very large gap that the AGDS tried to plug. After watching swarms and swarms of drones, loitering munitions and helicopter tactics wreck armor in modern conflicts, this in hindsight was actually quite relevant once again. And how do we see its DNA appear in some modern systems? Well, we do see the clearest example of the Stryker M Shurad system. Once again, done a video on that if you want to go check it out. And it's been fielded by the US Army as of 2021. Built on the Stryker chassis, it mounts a 30mm cannon, Stinger missiles, Hellfires and advanced sensors. Very, very useful platform. Meanwhile, in Russia, the Pantir S1 system, arguably the AGDS's closest real-world cousin, combines 12 ready-to-fire missiles with dual 30mm cannons, mounted on a mobile chassis. Pantsir has been used in Syria, Libya, Ukraine, defending everything from airfields to columns of vehicles. And it does fulfill almost the exact same mission that the AGDS was envisioned to do, protecting mobile forces from sudden air threats. Even Israel's Iron Dome, though a static system, shares the layered defense mindset, and now countries are adding hard-kill drone interceptors, laser systems, and even AI-assisted radar. All things AGDS was gesturing towards 30 years ago. So what's the legacy of this platform? Well, HDS showed what was possible. It was a conversation starter, a kind of talking piece while having a cigar in the defense sector and some whiskey late at night. It predicted the tactical need for networked mobile layered air defense, and it packaged it into a platform that could fight alongside the majority of the tank formations and survive in most frontline chaos. It even anticipated the need for dual-purpose firepower, something that we now expect Shorad systems to hopefully have. Now, it may have been forgotten by the Pentagon, but to military historians, engineers, and enthusiasts like you and I, it's a bit of a reminder that sometimes the most advanced ideas come before their time and unfortunately will never come to fruition. So there you have it, folks, the M1 Abrams AGDS, a battlefield guardian with more firepower than most tanks, more brains than the most modern SAM systems, and more potential than the defense world gave it credit for. It's one of those what-if vehicles that generally could have reshaped the way armored formations defend themselves. And of course, if you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to hit the like button. It really does mean a lot to me. I try my best to read all your comments, so let me know what you think of this platform. And if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you click that bell by the subscribe button. Do you think the AGDS should have been built? Do you think it would have still held up to today with modern upgrades, particularly that of Ukraine? I would love to hear what you think. Thanks so much for stopping by today, everyone. Thanks again also everyone who has been supporting my Patreon and my PayPal in financial donations. It really does mean a lot to me. And also those who have been doing super chats in the comments. It really, really helps me and my channel. It is just I, so those little gestures really, really, really mean a lot to me. Have a wonderful day, folks. Take care. Bye-bye.